Hey everyone, and thank you for watching today's episode. Now, before we start, I have to say thank you to our sponsor today, NordVPN. Now, NordVPN, uh, who you, I'm sure you're all aware of, is all about traversing through the internet safely and securely. NordVPN ensures that you can avoid ads and trackers while accessing amazing speeds through over 5,000 servers across 60 countries. NordVPN is easy to use with one click or even auto connect options and can be applied to six devices, has no bandwidth throttling, and their diskless servers store none of your data or configurations on site. This is to ensure that you can find and enjoy shows and games, not necessarily in your region, because geography shouldn't restrict you from having a good time. So sign up today to secure your internet at nordvpn.com slash completionist for a 30 day risk free trial. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash completionist. Completionist. Thank you for watching. Enjoy today's episode, and we'll talk soon. So, in professional wrestling, most promotions do their best to sign the best wrestlers and keep them to themselves. But more recently, Tony Khan of AEW has been using the term the forbidden door lately, meaning that at any point, any wrestler in any promotion in the world can come to AEW for a high profile match. While this isn't the first time in wrestling this has happened, far from it, it kind of has changed the modern landscape of wrestling, allowing wrestlers from different promotions to show up anytime, anywhere. Now this sounds like something small, but in the gaming world, especially with something like Super Smash Brothers, a lot of forbidden doors were blown wide open. However, all the way back in 2004, Nintendo opened the forbidden door a little bit. Solid Snake was easily one of the most recognizable PlayStation characters alongside Crash Bandicoot, Cloud, and Spyro the Dragon. So it was a complete shock when Konami announced that a remake of Metal Gear Solid was releasing only on a Nintendo console, let alone the GameCube. So today, you're gonna see whether or not it was worth it when I complete Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes. Hey everyone, and welcome to The Completionist New Game Plus, where I am re-completing the first 120 games I ever featured here on the channel. More details in the description down below. Metal Gear Solid is one of the most important games on the PlayStation, helping to define what it means to be an action game. Seriously, I don't know if we'd even have anything close to the Arkham games, Assassin's Creed, or even the Hitman titles if it wasn't for Metal Gear Solid's tactical espionage action. So enough stalling, and let's get right- Oh crap, it's Ted! I gotta hide! Hey Gerard, I'm ready to film live action for uh... Guess he's not here. And the battle continues! This could turn it all around! This bout will determine who is the strongest once and for all! In the early 2000s, the console wars were continuing to go strong. Most people saw themselves as either a Nintendo, PlayStation, or Xbox kid. And if you even made eye contact with someone from another faction, let alone breathe the same air as them, you were obligated to engage in a fierce dance knife fight with the sharks and the jets like in West Side Story. Or at least that's what it seemed like when I was a kid. I personally thought the whole console wars thing was stupid. Just let people enjoy their games. Either way, whenever a franchise or developer changed their platform, people talked about it. It was a big deal when Sonic and Sega games came to the Nintendo consoles that we knew. This happened in 2002 with Resident Evil Remake, shocking people everywhere. And they were even more shocked in 2003 when Metal Gear Solid had a remake called The Twin Snakes that did the exact same thing. But that wasn't where the surprises stopped. Konami not only announced that the Twin Snakes wouldn't be on the PS2, but Konami and Hideo Kojima, the series creator, would not be as involved in the development process as they were for the original. Those responsibilities would largely fall into the lap of Silicon Knights, the creators behind Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem. And instead, Kojima and Shigeru Miyamoto would simply guide the team. Now, if this was just a graphical remaster, this would still be very surprising. But this was going to be a complete remake of the original Metal Gear Solid, using mechanics from Metal Gear Solid 2 with its own graphics engine. Plus, the cutscenes would be remade from scratch, and the original cast was brought back to re-record all of the voiceovers. This wasn't just a basic remake or port. This was a pretty large overhaul of the original game. 
Fans of the original were angry because of these changes, but as someone who doesn't have an immense amount of nostalgia for the original PlayStation version, personally, I actually think this was a good thing. The PS1 version is not bad by any means, but when I first talked about it for the completionist, its age was beginning to show. Controls were clunky, and the graphics, well, they were PS1. But now take a look at Twin Snakes. Look at Snake himself. That looks like him, right? Now look at the original Snake in the original Metal Gear Solid. One looks like the person we all know, while the other looks like you took a block of clay, smeared it a little bit, and said, yeah, okay, I'm done. That didn't work in Mrs. Firkin's middle school art class when I was younger, and it doesn't work here. And yes, the cutscenes are longer and much more ridiculous, but that's exactly what Hideo Kojima wanted. He brought on Ryuhei Kitamura to direct the cutscenes because he made insane action films. And when Kitamura just remade the cutscenes shot for shot, Kojima made him redo them to be more ridiculous. This resulted in a lot more action-packed moments and bullet time sequences. But once again, fans were pretty pissed. But at the same time, I I completely understand why Kojima did that. A guy who names a character Die Hard Man would absolutely have Solid Snake flip over a missile. Also, the ridiculous cinematics finally match how bonkers the story is. All right, let's set the stage for those of you who don't know. The game takes place on Shadow Moses Island in the 1998 version of 2005. Enter the Special Forces Unit Boxhound, which rebelled under the leadership of Liquid Snake. They took control of Metal Gear Rex, a giant robot that can launch a nuclear warhead any anywhere in the world, and in doing so, they held the world ransom in exchange for the body of Big Boss, the best soldier ever, in order to take his genes and create an army of super soldiers. Colonel Ray Campbell, the former leader of Foxhound, has brought Solid Snake out of retirement for one final mission. Now this is all before the game actually starts. This doesn't even get into Meryl, Otacon, Gray Fox, the members of Foxhound, Liquid and Solid Snake's relationship, and so much more that happens in this game. But to really understand all of that, you kind of have to experience Metal Gear Solid for yourself. And to do that, you've got to play it. And complete it, I did! Way back in the day, I did everything possible in Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation 1, and it took me over 20 different playthroughs. Not only that, but the episode got taken down for copyright reasons, meaning that Metal Gear Solid was a pain in the ass even after I finished making the damn episode. In other words, this was one of my least favorite completion experiences ever, and the reason I haven't tackled any other Hideo Kojima game here on the show. I'm not saying this is a bad game. I originally gave Metal Gear Solid a finipedit rating because I thought it was really good, actually. But for my experience on this show, it was awful. So this time, I am playing Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes on the Nintendo GameCube. And spoiler alert, it was so much easier this time. When I first played Metal Gear Solid for the very first time in my life, my biggest complaints were with its controls. I thought they were clunky and sluggish and didn't really make Solid Snake feel like the ultimate stealth soldier the internet knows him as. But since Twin Snakes uses the same control scheme as Metal Gear Solid 2, it feels so much better, even though I've only kind of dabbled in Metal Gear Solid 2. Normally I don't play stealth games, I'm more of a run in and beat the crap out of everything kind of guy. And although you can go through the game beating up or gunning down every guard on Shadow Moses Island, the preferred method of execution is stealth and I have to admit that does feel a lot more satisfying. Now there are a ton of great ways to maneuver your way around enemy guards, including crawling, knocking to make noise, the classic cardboard box, and hiding dirty magazines in the guards' paths. I mean, after all, this is a Hideo Kojima game. But since Twin Snakes borrows a lot from Metal Gear Solid 2, you can now also hang over edges and hide in lockers. Although I didn't use those nearly as much as I used the box. As you play, you'll see a radar on the top right corner of your screen. And this not only shows you the layout of the surrounding area, but also tells you where the guards are and where their field of vision is, making it easier to avoid them or or just take them down stealthily. However, this is only on the earlier difficulties, being normal, easy, and very easy. In hard mode and the unlockable extreme mode, there is no radar at all. And this makes things much harder, which is why you should really build up to those last difficulties. If you go straight out the gate for hard mode, you'll be lost, confused, 
and murdered multiple times over and over. But if you get stuck, don't worry, you'll have access to the codec in every difficulty. Now for you non-seasoned fans of Metal Gear Solid, the codec is a communication device that connects you to all of the characters that support Solid Snake on his journeys. Colonel Campbell and Naomi can give you hints, Mei Ling saves your game, and Otacon will give you information based on where to go and what's in the base. All of these people and the other characters are incredibly useful and great if you need a break from the action. Seriously, the writing is great here. And truth be told, you get to really know these characters through and through because of these codec moments. These moments not only flesh out Solid Snake as a character, but the relationships across all the characters in the game. It's really fascinating. Another reason to prefer stealth over sheer aggression is your ranking at the very end of the game, which is a huge component when it comes to completing it. After you beat the final boss, you'll be rewarded a rank based on how fast you beat the game, how few people you've killed, how many times you were discovered, and how often you saved the game. While there are a ton of oddly named ranks like Jaws, Giant Panda, and Capybara, the highest rank and the only one that truly matters is Big Boss Rank. That means that you successfully met all of the previous criteria as few times as possible without dying or healing. Now, let me be clear, this is incredibly difficult. However, it was made a lot easier in Twin Snakes. And this is solely because of the more awesome additions from Metal Gear Solid 2. First thing is the tranquilizer gun. Now there are a ton of cool weapons with interesting uses like the Nikita missiles, but the Trank gun is easily the most useful. Since you need to kill as few people as possible to get the big boss ranking, being able to put them to sleep instead of to death is necessary, and now you can do that from a distance. On top of that, you can also get access to the first person mode that makes aiming a lot easier. Seriously, this took me literally 20 playthroughs when I originally completed this game. Because of the new mechanics here in Twin Snakes, I did it in one. Yes, that is a lot easier, and I'm aware that I have gotten a lot better at games, even though I think I suck. And of course, I respect fans out there that love the franchise, especially the first game. But I will take it that this was much easier because of the mechanics. Speaking of bosses, the bosses in Metal Gear Solid are awesome, whether you're playing on the PS1 or GameCube. Each one feels like a highlight, with my personal favorites being the sniper battle with Sniper Wolf and Psycho Mantis. Now, I would go into more details about Psycho Mantis, but if you know why it's awesome, I don't need to tell you again. It's one of those fights where the game's playing a big trick on you and it's up to you to figure out what it is. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you really ought to experience it for yourself. Seriously, it's one of the most innovative boss battles in gaming history. And if you have a huge backlog of game saves on your memory card, it makes it that much more fun. Trust me when I say, Play Metal Gear Solid just for that moment. But the biggest new addition in terms of completion criteria is the collectible dog tag. Now these are a series of dog tags that you can take from almost every single soldier and bosses in the game. And these tags have some basic info about them, like their name and what their blood type is. And these dog tags are really cool because yes, there are the ones based off of the big characters in the game from the plot, but all of the unknown nobody soldiers are based on members of the development team and how you get them is also kind of the order of the cast list. Now, in order to receive a guard's dog tags, you have to sneak up behind them and actually threaten them. This is a great way to introduce collectibles into a game that's all about being a sneaky soldier. However, there is a catch here. You don't just have to collect all the dog tags on the base. You have to collect all the dog tags on the base for each difficulty, and that includes extreme mode. So this may start off cool and novel, but it loses its novelty when you're forced to repeat the same actions four additional times. And yes, a few more are added in each subsequent difficulty. And that's not nearly enough to make this all interesting. The thing that does make these additional playthroughs interesting are all of the Easter eggs and weird bits that were put into the game. Hideo Kojima does this with all of his games and it really makes them feel special. In Twin Snakes, these include a ton of references to different Silicon Knights titles. There's Nintendo characters in Otacon's lab that if you shoot, you get life. And seeing Meryl in her underwear if you move through the game fast enough. Because like I said, this is a Hideo Kojima game. Overall, I think that Metal Gear Solid is a much better title on the Nintendo GameCube than it is on the PlayStation 1. And I know, calm down, just hear me out. I know a lot of the Metal Gear heads out there are gonna come at me for that, but just look from my perspective, all right? It's my job to complete everything possible in the game for this show, right? If there is anything that just makes this process 
that much easier for me, I would absolutely embrace it with open arms. Add on better overall graphics, better overall controls, and I am a happy completionist. Plus, I get to play this game with the Nintendo GameCube controller, and that's a win in my book. One of the best controllers ever made. One of the things that didn't really change from the original Metal Gear Solid was the rewards, and they're really great. For each different way and difficulty you beat the game, there is a different reward to an extent. Now, if you submit to the torture earlier in the game, during the torture section, you know what I'm talking about, you will unlock Otacon's ending and get a stealth suit that makes you completely invisible. If you don't submit, you'll unlock Meryl's ending and get a bandana that gives you unlimited ammo. Do both of these and you will unlock an alternate costume for Snake that is a tuxedo. If you get both of these endings again, you'll unlock alternate costumes for Meryl and Otacon in the demo theater, a menu where you can just watch the cutscenes. So you can literally rewatch the ending with Meryl in her stealth suit. And amongst all those completions, you'll also unlock more minor things that beg you to complete the game. It's great that the game rewards you for multiple playthroughs, and it is made much easier now that you can just skip codec messages and cutscenes. But this was mostly the same things that we got in the original Metal Gear Solid. So what does Twin Snakes offer that's different? Well, first up, and the biggest thing, that'd be the aforementioned dog tags. Like I said earlier, you have to play all the way through all five difficulties in Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes to get them all. So minimum, you're going to have to play the game five goddamn times to make sure that you get all of the dog tags in the game. And for doing so, you get f nothing. Now, this has become less of an issue for me. Over the years, I've gotten used to nothing being a common reward for a lot of the games here on this show. But it is especially disappointing here because it's the only collectible in the game. It's tedious to get all of them. When it comes to the base game, the main rewards for it are the bandana and the stealth suit I mentioned earlier. I really wish that Silicon Knights came up with something to reward the player for doing all that extra work. TLDR, getting the dog tags is a complete waste of your time. And this is a shame because I had a much more enjoyable time with Twin Snakes than I had with the original PS1 version. Now, don't get me wrong, both games are great. But for me, the updated controls made getting that final rank a lot easier, and it was more fun for me. But it is a double-edged sword because it also made the five additional playthroughs to get all the dog tags boring. Now, the true nature is that I had to do six playthroughs total, and that's because of one factor. Getting big boss rank on extreme is very difficult. Cult. Seriously, you have to memorize everything about this game. The bandana and the sneak suit made this process so much easier tenfold. And I was able to retain all the information I had to do because, well, I did all this back to back to back. In the end, it took six playthroughs, five for all difficulties, and then one more additional playthrough for that final big boss rank. By the time I was done, I was really sick of playing this game. When I completed Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes, there were 23 deaths. Most of these deaths literally took place in my normal mode playthrough. Once I learned the patterns of the bosses, hard and extreme mode weren't that bad. 154 dog tags collected. These were a novelty at first, but it did grow quite tedious after that first playthrough. Six playthroughs in order to get all the unlockable skins, power-ups, dog tags, and that final big boss rank, resulting in a total of 25 hours of total playtime. Literally one third of the time it took me to complete the original game. And three wigs that you would get for collecting all the dog tags in Metal Gear Solid 2 that I'm not gonna wear here. I guess my grip strength won't be getting any stronger anytime soon. Completing Metal Gear Solid 1 for the PS1 was very rough, but I had a lot more fun with the Twin Snakes version on GameCube. It looks a lot better, it controls and feels a lot better, and I personally love the new insane cutscenes and voice acting. Not to discredit the original, the original is great the way that it is. Metal Gear Solid influenced all other cinematic action games for a reason, and you owe it to yourself to play it, whether it's on the PlayStation or the GameCube. But completion is still a whole other story. Playing through the story six times immediately in a row is a lot. And it especially gets frustrating when you realize the dog tags don't do anything and they all change on every difficulty. So the motivation for your fifth time beating the game is essentially pointless. Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes is great, but I personally don't think it warrants more than two playthroughs max. So. With that in mind, guys, I give this game my new completionist rating of Finish It. Finish.
Finish it! it.